Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, you are warmly welcome to this keynote session. And I have a great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor David Gibbels. Uh, Professor Gibbel is the Professor of Learning and Instruction in the Faculty of Social Sciences of the University of Antwerpen, Belgium. David is coordinating the scientific research network on learning strategies in informal and social learning contexts. Uh, Professor Kippels is a distinguished scholar who has conducted research and wi widely published in high-level international refereed forums in the areas of learning and instruction in higher education and professional learning in working life. These topics include uh, such as student learning, workplace and lifelong learning, and different approach, approaches of active learning. In 2011, David has received the Eric de Corte Award for young and promising scholar in the science of learning and instruction uh, on the early conference in Exeter. At the moment, David is uh, editor-in-chief of Educational Research Review, and further he serves in editorial boards of several journals, such as Contemporary Educational Psychology, Vocation and Learning, Active Learning in Higher Education, and New Perspectives in Learning and Instruction. And we are very happy that David has also been the coordinator of SIG-14, uh, Learning and Professional Development. So thank you, David, for coming to, to make this keynote. And you are mostly welcome. Thank you, Annalie. Thank you for this nice introduction. Thank you all uh, for coming to my keynote lecture. Um, let's start. This is how I would like to structure uh, my presentation. It's one of my favorite paintings. The resolution is not optimal. My screen is much smaller, but I don't give that much keynote lecture, so I didn't realize it would get that big. Uh, but anyway, the title of this beautiful painting by Paul Gauguin, as some of you uh, might have uh, recognized, is D'où venons-nous, que sommes-nous, où allons-nous? And uh, don't be worried, I won't continue in French. Um, so I also translated uh, the title of this beautiful painting. Where do we come from? What are we? And where are we going? So that's what I want uh, to do with you today uh, for the next 45 minutes. I try hard to stay within my time frame. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit more about where I come from, personally, but uh, also the, the research that I'd like to present to you, uh, where, uh, where it comes from. Uh, what are we? I'm not going to have uh, these ontological uh, reflections uh, with you, but I would like to tell you what are we doing now, so what kind of research uh, we're doing now, but I also want to reflect with you uh, on the question where we are going or where I think uh, the field should uh, be going or which directions I think are interesting. So I try to also look critical at my own work uh, together with you. So first, uh, where do we come from? Well, these are, from a professional uh, perspective, the places I uh, come from. I did my master in Leuven University, and then after that went to work in Maastricht University. Uh, and this is the beautiful building of the Faculty of Law, where I spent uh, four beautiful years uh, with nice colleagues there, and uh, did some nice work there, and was also uh, lucky enough to be able to uh, do a PhD there. After my PhD, I went to Antwerp University, another beautiful university in Belgium, uh, where I was uh, appointed uh, to join the 
newly established center of excellence in higher education with the idea to support the professional development of teaching staff in the university and also to do research on the, the professional uh, development of this specific group. And um, I really like this university and the position, but I switched to another position and I'm still there now uh, in the Faculty of Social Sciences uh, as a professor of learning and instruction, and I'm still enjoying my time there now. This is the research group I have uh, the privilege, I would say, to work in. Uh, you might have seen uh, several of these giving uh, presentations, and uh, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd love to include this in the presentation because I really feel privileged to work with you guys. Uh, it's a really stimulating environment, and to assure you, it's not only these kind of activities, uh, but we tend to t only take pictures on these kind of activities, uh, I, I, I'd say that. So, uh, really a, a, an interesting place uh, to work. Uh, who inspires me uh, a lot, my colleagues, but uh, I, I also owe a lot of uh, gratitude to the early community. So I feel really honored that I can be here today um, because uh, early has really been important for me and for my scientific uh, career. Several people within early, maybe especially people within uh, SIG14, whom I also owe a lot of thanks because they suggested me as a keynote uh, uh, speaker. Um, so, uh, yeah, a lot of inspiration I, got, um, I have from, from this community, also outside the community. And before I really start to, t to talk about my research, uh, these are the people that are co-responsible for the work I will be telling about uh, soon. These are the people's, uh, uh, people I have been writing uh, uh, with, so uh, they probably inspired me the most. So thank you. Uh, rather doing, than forgetting it in the end of my presentation, I thought I, I'd, do it in, I, I'd do it at the start. Uh, but when I was thinking about um, giving a keynote lecture, uh, it's a special uh, occasion, and I, I would like to take this special occasion to, uh, uh, to show you this picture. This picture tells a little bit about where I come from. You can see here in the corner, these are Belgian waffles. So, although I did my PhD in the Netherlands, I'm definitely a Belgian. Uh, this is homemade cake. Uh, this is me, it's my seventh birthday. But I was telling you that I learned a lot from the scientific community, from my colleagues. But when I was reflecting upon people I learned most from, or I would say the most important things I li in life, I probably learned from this man, who was my grandfather. And he was not an academic. Um, he uh, wor worked as a coal miner in, in, in a time when Belgium still had uh, coal mines. Uh, so also an international environment. Um, uh, as a mine worker. And um, early asked me one year ago, or more than one year ago, to give a title for my presentation. So you saw the title, it's Supporting Lifelong Learning student learning uh, in higher education and beyond. So I want to talk about professional learning, student learning in higher education, but my grandfather definitely didn't went to higher education and still he was able to give me, uh, to, to uh, inspire me and to learn me the most important things in life. He retired when he was a little bit older than I am, uh, actually, so that was possible uh, at that time. Um, and learning and professional development in the context of work would sound very strange to him. Uh, when he talked about his work, it was more about surviving and making sure that you would uh, still be alive uh, at the end of the day, uh, so to speak. So, although the topic I will be talking about uh, would sound very strange to him, uh, if he were still here, uh, um, so although that topic would sounds very strange, I'm sure he would be very proud uh, uh, to me, so. All right, and um, his life, uh, his work situation, also his educational situation looks totally different uh, than mine, but also than the students I'm teaching. I'm teaching in a master uh, training in educational sciences, and what's interesting in our master program is that about, let's say, 75% of our students combines uh, going to university with professional life. 
Uh, so they decide either to stop their professional life and go back to university or be a part-time student uh, in our master program. Uh, so I realized that these students I work with, um, a lot of them are older than my grandfather had when he retired. And uh, they decide to come to university again, so they see higher education as a, an interesting place. And nearly all of them do that uh, because they have professional aspirations, because they want to change uh, their job, or because they see growing possibilities. So, so they see higher education as a place uh, that can offer something for their future profession, for the current or future professional career. Um, so, lots, a lot of things changed, I think, to uh, compared to the situation uh, where my grandfather father worked, and also work environments changed. The, my, the workplace of my grandfather is now a nice museum uh, with a nice cafeteria that was not there definitely when uh, when he worked there. So. Work has changed, and uh, higher university definitely also uh, changed. Uh, work has become increasingly uh, knowledge intensively, uh, and uh, work environments change more rapidly, uh, probably, than they used to change. And it has to do because we're living in a knowledge intensive uh, economy. Uh, I'm uh, not, not telling anything uh, news, and um, the students we prepare in higher education, uh, most of them start a career as a knowledge worker, or as people that we label as knowledge workers. So that's also the first project I would like uh, to talk uh, with you about, uh, the Learning Above the Ruler project, which sees the knowledge worker as a lifelong learner learner because within these knowledge intensive organizations um, it's important that the employees keep on learning uh, and keep on getting bet better because that's when also the organization uh, can grow only because people get smarter organizations uh, can get smarter and I learned this quote I'm not sure if it's Joseph's quote but I learned it uh, from Joseph so I, I thought I'd put his picture there uh, which is very relevant in, in this perspective, being grass doesn't grow faster if you pull it. And this is especially true for knowledge uh, workers. Uh, for organizations, it's important that, the, that these knowledge workers keep on investing in learning. But it's a bit contradictory. Uh, or Joseph also talks about the, uh, the uh, a paradox here because it's hard to force uh, people to learn uh, because then definitely that's probably the best way to avoid uh, these kind of people uh, to learn. So you have to hope that you can create an environment where people uh, do think that learning is important. And that's also one of the, the starts of the Learning Above the Ruler uh, project. Uh, the idea of this project was uh, to do a project to help to increase the self-knowledge on why and now how knowledge workers uh, learn. And the interesting thing here uh, is that um, a company came to us, Domo de Refontiro. It's a company that um, calls itself facilitator in human processes. So that's interesting in working together with companies. They are very good in f uh, finding very nice words to describe uh, the things uh, that you do. So facilitator in human competences. Um, they help organizations uh, in the people within the organizations how to learn and to reorganize organizations, but they also offer trainings uh, to people and so on. And this uh, company came to, uh, uh, to us to ask, can you help us in developing something? Um, I'd like to refer here to the research uh, of uh, Katrien Kuivers in our research group. She, she's studying um, medical specialists who are, by definition, I think, uh, knowledge workers. And one of the interesting results of her ongoing research is that um, these workers are not aware of how and why they learn. Uh, and it's true for a lot of uh, knowledge workers. So the company came to us to ask us, can you help us developing something in uh, supporting people to uh, increase the self-knowledge on why and how they learn? And they had several other plans uh, in this. And they came to us because within the research group, we had been active 
in the field of education uh, in developing uh, self-assessment uh, instruments and feedback instruments based on existing uh, validated uh, scales within the literature that we uh, translated to uh, basically to Dutch in, in a lot of uh, cases, did a revalidation and also built uh, feedback instruments. So it's true, uh, this is an example for students in uh, secondary education, also used in higher education, but also to support students in the transition from um, secondary vocational education uh, to the first steps in the professional, professional career, we developed such uh, instruments. And so the company was aware of that and asked us, can you help us developing something uh, for knowledge workers that we work with? And the Learning Above the Ruler project was born. Uh, together we looked for funding and we got some funding. Uh, so this is the team that worked on it. Might see some familiar faces. Piet uh, is also there, and Gert worked on it as a postdoc. And these are uh, Peter and Crystal from the company. Uh, uh. So I tell a little bit about the project. The interesting thing also about working together with companies is that they think it's important to save a budget uh, to communicate it nice. So they invested uh, in a movie that shortly explains uh, the project. So. It's a very short uh, movie. I skipped the music so that I can do a voiceover uh, in English with you. So this is the knowledge worker. Yeah, there he is. And there's a computer. <laughs> All right. So, and it starts. What happens is the idea is that the knowledge worker completes the, uh, what we call then the knowledge competence monitor, which is an instrument uh, in which these kind of concepts you see there that look familiar to most of you, uh, obviously, uh, like self-regulation uh, strategies, uh, motivation, uh, self-efficacy, uh, these kinds of concepts uh, were measured and were given feedback uh, upon we asked, uh, and, and the situation was a professional development activity that they would uh, going to be engaged in. The instrument is still online, the feedback is also online, so if you consider yourself as a knowledge worker and are interested in your learning competence profile, as it was called in, in that uh, uh, project, feel free to go after the keynote. <laughs> to this website and uh, make your own assessment about uh, whether you think this, this was interesting or not. In any case, the interesting thing for us as researchers uh, was that we uh, um, could collaborate uh, uh, with the company um, and learn a lot from that also, but that we uh, could collect interesting data uh, also because uh, the company asked organizations they worked with uh, to uh, the people working in the organizations to complete this question is before they started working uh, with them. So we have uh, uh, we did some analysis on the. Uh, self-report uh, data we had, but was what's also interesting, because we had a close uh, cooperation, we could also uh, do observations in, uh, as to, to how these people would behave in a professional uh, learning uh, uh, or in a professional development activity. Um, so we have data of how these students or how these people self-report themselves in terms of what we labeled uh, uh, learning competences and you saw, the, you saw the variables that we took into account. But we also now uh, uh, have observational data, a full day of training where we uh, tried uh, to link uh, these two data sets to each other. Uh, here are some results and uh, I agree with you that they're probably not so shocking. Uh, the results uh, that, that were, um, for instance, that autonomously motivated knowledge workers self-regulate their learning activities uh, in professional uh, development activities and that also autonomously motivated knowledge workers use more deep approaches to learning in self uh, in professional uh, development uh, activities. So kind of things you would expect uh, came out 
which was very useful information for the company because, um, the, for instance, when uh, uh, based on the self-report, they uh, um, have the information that the autonomously motivated motivation is rather low in the group they're working in, they, they start doing other activities. Uh, uh, so from their perspective, this was uh, interesting. Remember that we also had the observational uh, data. So for us, it was interesting to see, okay, we can create profiles, or we can, uh, uh, based on self-report data, can we see uh, differences uh, with, with, between people scoring different on the self-report data and uh, in how they behave, behave in, uh, in uh, professional development activities. So we have huge amounts of video that we uh, went into and, um, well, um, I think this is the best conclusion I can make so far that it's difficult to observe what we call learning competences in use in the professional uh, development context. Uh, so we were actually not able to make a lot of sense of what we were, uh, were seeing because we, we, ha we had very few cues in what these people uh, were doing then that we could relate to, this, to the self-report data. Uh, so I call that here a data triangulation challenges, challenge. Uh, and I'll come back to that uh, when I present some more uh, research and also present some ideas on how uh, we can move on uh, with that. But now I'd like to go back to the relationship between the knowledge economy and higher education. Um, so not only important at the workplace, but we are also preparing students for a life as knowledge worker or as lifelong learner. And that also puts some challenges to higher uh, education, higher education, who, um, yeah, you can read it everywhere, is more and more uh, working towards produ producing, hesitate a bit to, to use that word, uh, um, graduates who are prepared for a life as lifelong learning. And in literature, you can find that at least part of this should be the development of deep approaches to learning. I heard it in a lot of sessions uh, also in, in this conference. So the question uh, that I want to tackle in the next couple of slides is this question. If this is considered to be important, does higher education succeed in promoting such deep learning strategies uh, before st they leave uh, students to the workplace? And here's a, a small commercial. I'm sure Luke would be happy with that. <laughs> um, talking about Talking about uh, deep learning strategies, there's a, quite some variety in theoretical frameworks that's used in the literature to operationalize or to look at what we mean by deep learning strategies. So together with Luke, I had the opportunity to guest edit a special issue for Education Psychology Review that's, that's out in the air on student learning in higher education where we uh, had an interesting bunch of articles uh, by really great uh, uh, authors describing different uh, theoretical frameworks and we asked them also to make connections, directions and also to label some cul-de-sac or dead ends uh, in, in the literature. I would like to focus now on two uh, dominant models, I'd like to say, within Europe, and that's the student approach to lear learning tradition. And I realize Sari is giving a keynote uh, on, um, on, some, on, on a topic that comes close uh, to that as well, so I appreciate you're here. <laughs> um, and the learning pattern model uh, that uh, has been started by uh, Jan Vermund. So I'd, I will focus on these two theoretical frameworks to see how they operationalize deep learning and see whether looking from that perspective we can, we can conclude or not that students develop more high, deeper approaches to learning during higher education before we leave them off to the workplace. All right, here's Luke again. So the student approach uh, to learning tradition, very quickly started about 40 years ago uh, has been interested in describing qualitative different ways in how uh, students approach uh, their learning. There's a lot to say about it. Um, I would like to conclude with that there's now a rich body of literature and that in general two different 
approaches, so-called approaches to learning, have been described a deep approach uh, to learning, uh, meaning that students engage in, in uh, um, or aim to uh, create meaning or, or find meaning, so have the intention uh, to go for meaning and, and use strategies that are appropriate for that, and the surface approach to learning where students use more uh, um, uh, road learning uh, strategies because they do not necessarily have the intention to understand, but have the in their intentions usually lay outside the goals of the specific task. It's very, very short uh, and not very nuanced. But what's interesting uh, in, in this particular framework, and this is the 3P model by John Biggs, uh, who was also very has been was not a European, obviously. Uh, um, but uh, also in Australia, this research tradition has been very influential. And in his 3P model, he uh, makes very clear that uh, approaches to learning are conceptualized as, an, as the result of an interaction between students' characteristics and characteristics of the learning environment. So with the, they are result of an interaction of both context and student uh, variables. And that's also why this concept, concept of approach to learning, has also been used in work situations. And for instance, Jean Kirby in Canada has developed approaches to learning at work. Um, questionnaire that was heavily built on the ideas uh, from uh, John Big, exactly because of the relation with, with the context. So, um, with Henna Asikainen, I did a review uh, in that special uh, issue, looking from that particular uh, uh, theoretical perspective, uh, and we were looking for longitudinal research uh, in higher education, uh, so uh, studies that reported at least two measurement moments in higher education, so that would report a change in deep approaches uh, to learning. We were able to find 43 studies that met our criteria for inclusion. So we were uh, looking, we, we, uh, we did our analysis, and I'll show you the results. These are how we uh, summarized. <laughs> I stole this picture from you, Hannah. Um, uh, the, the results went actually in every direction. There were as much studies uh, um, showing an increase in the deep approach to learning as there were showing that there was no decrease, and there was also a whole bunch of studies showing a decrease in the approach to learning. We digged into methodological or conceptual explanations, and when I was asked by early to make a video to introduce my lecture one year ago, we thought that we would find a way out there to explain why in some studies we would find a deep an increase and in other studies we would find a decrease, but we were actually not. Um, what, we, what we did find, and that's in, what we found interesting, um, is that um, most studies were quantitative in nature. We looked for all types uh, of studies. Most studies used the John Biggs framework of approaches uh, to learning, and also most studies looked over the time span of a year. And we thought that was a bit strange, if, uh, because uh, from uh, conceptual, or if you look at the framework, uh, the, the idea is that there's an interaction between a specific learning environment and and student characteristics to define an approach to learning, while in the studies they kind of ignored it when they do longitudinal research, and we are ourselves, or I was myself to blame as well, because you wanted to do longitudinal research, you use that concept, but ask how do you study in general, and how hard did you study in, in the past year, and this doesn't really match with the idea uh, of the concept. So, we think that doing longitudinal research in this way across higher education, which, which takes three or four or five or six or seven years, that this framework might not be so useful to, to use from that perspective. There's other ways in which the framework might be useful. And that there are probably other frameworks that were hopefully uh, more helpful to us. So we also uh, uh, looked into the research on the learning pattern uh, model, and uh, here's another commercial. This is a book edited uh, by Eva Kind and other colleagues uh, on transitions 
uh, within higher education and from higher education to the workplace. And we have a chapter uh, in this in which we describe the research on, on, on learning uh, patterns. And in the learning pattern framework, uh, learning strategies are seen as general preferences for learning, characterizing students for a certain period of time. So, not necessarily within, uh, related to one course, but the, by definition, it's already a bit broader. And deep learning in this learning pattern model um, is one cognitive processing uh, strategies. Cognitive processing defined uh, as those strategies and study skills students possess and apply uh, to possess subject matter. And specifically for deep processing, we're talking about strategies such as, such as relating, structuring, and critical processing. So, in that chapter we describe, uh, it, well, the, uh, there has been a literature review in 2011 all, already on then, so we looked for more recent uh, uh, studies and did ourselves also uh, some studies, and we found here uh, some more evidence for a, an uh, increase in deep approach uh, uh, or in deep learning uh, strategies throughout higher education. So during higher education, students seem to predominantly uh, evolve toward a more deep way of learning. This was especially through near the end uh, of higher education. What was interesting, um, doing these uh, reviews and doing these studies is that uh, and this is the part where I start to look critically at my own uh, research, mm. is that you read also several of your own uh, stuff, and it's a bit confronting when you enter the discussion part, and you realize that you have been writing several arguments as to, in future research, we should... Uh, uh, or some of the shortcomings of these studies are, and in future research, we should... If I realize that a group of people, myself included, repeats the same arguments uh, uh, for several years, the same shortcomings, and we're generating new studies without tackling, actually, uh, the shortcomings. And this is a very... Uh, is, is a shortcoming that you find in most uh, of these studies, including my own, that we must be cautious because the results are based on self-report data, basically questionnaires and interviews, and they ask for student learning at the general or sometimes at a course uh, level, but they might not be so good indicators for how students actually process as at the task level, which is where learning, uh, when students are learning, they're not learning in general, uh, but learning also typically happens at a specific task, and then there might be another task, so there might be a pattern in, in there, and we tend to uh, uh, want to say something about what's happening at a specific task level while using instruments that are much uh, more broader. So, as I told, I read a lot in my own research that in future research we should uh, try to look for other measures uh, or include more behavioral uh, measures uh, and so on. So, um, that's where we are now. I think I'd like to present uh, some work where we try to take that uh, into account. Uh, I call this part reculer pour mieux sauter, some other French. Um, SIG 14, by the way, will have its next conference uh, in Geneva and we'll also have, in order to connect to the French-speaking community, some, um, some French uh, sessions and they're already uh, said, well, because you're a Belgium, you can do the re you can do the reviews in French. So, so I cannot, but uh, I have some French uh, quotes. Oh, I like this quote. Before I so before I tell you what we have been doing, of what we are trying to do now in order uh, to do more than the self-report in this type of research, I think um, I need to tell you a little bit more in a more elaborated way about the origins of this research tradition uh, in Europe, and this is. Uh, uh, most of these studies refer to what's called the Göteborg uh, studies, studies by uh, uh, Martin and Selye in, in the 70s, 
uh, and John Richardson actually wrote an interesting paper about it because a lot of people ref refer to it, but definitely not all people referring to these papers have read uh, uh, these papers. So I'll quickly tell where, what interesting stuff they did in the 70s. Um, so what they did was they did an experiment. Uh, and they gave students uh, a series of texts. So this is the first text. Um, and they asked students to study the text. And one group of students, or they gave all students questions, but two, there were two groups of students. They didn't know they were in two groups. And one group of students got questions asked, uh, more reproduction-oriented questions. And another group of students got questions in which they were asked to relate uh, concepts to each other or to explain it in their own words. So more questions that were asked them to generate meaning of the text. After that first text, they got a second text, and the same happened. The one group got reproduction-oriented question, the other group got meaning-oriented question, and after that group, they got a third text, and guess what? They were interviewed after that uh, third text. So, and then they asked um, how they studied uh, the text. And this actually, they conclude that we're not talking in that these studies about approaches to learning at all, but they were describing different ways in which uh, students uh, studied texts. They, they, they could conclude that there were different ways and that these differences could be triggered by the nature of the questions students received uh, uh, or, or would expect uh, but because they, uh, they did not receive questions after the third text, but they would expect similar questions and therefore they uh, they uh, told they were uh, uh, um, showing different study behavior. So this is a, a powerful study that shows the, the power of assessment uh, to influence uh, the learning behavior uh, of studies. And based on these uh, studies in the 80s and 90s, several researchers have been developing uh, self-report uh, instrument, the ideas have been taken, and people like Jan, uh, although Jan's instrument is a little bit more complicated and also includes other uh, things like Jan Vermund, Noel Mistel, John Biggs, they developed questionnaires to measure students' approaches to learning or learning patterns in a general uh, way, how do you study in general, or related to a specific course, uh, like Noel Entwistle and John Biggs uh, did, or how, uh, um, how you study in a workplace, like, uh, or how you learn in a workplace, like you did. And I think, uh, we thought that this was interesting, that from these experimental interview studies, um, that were at task level, instruments that were at a more general level, uh, had been developed. And although these instruments, and we have been using them themselves, and have been developing feedback instruments of which practitioners are very happy that they can use them, and they, they result in very interesting information, uh, still more and more researchers, including ourselves, start to ask questions like, what, um, what, what have we been measuring, and how does it relate to student study behavior and specific tasks. So there's a call for more data triangulation with other more behavioral measures. And this part I call back to the future uh, because, uh, and particularly Lynn uh, has been active in this part. Um, what we have been doing is actually basically doing replicas uh, of the study and adding uh, other more behavioral or online measures. Uh, so we took the studies from the 70s and did exactly the same, actually gave students a text, two conditions, a surface learning condition in which we offered them uh, reproduction oriented and a deep learning condition in which we offered them meaning uh, directed uh, uh, question. So when, we, when you do that three times, you can expect similar things. But we did not only do an interview, we also used an eye tracking an eye tracker when students were studying this text and used uh, the eye tracking data, but also um, did acute recall um, so that students could see the, uh, where they had been looking at to, re to, to support them in explaining what they, what they had been doing. We published this in frontline learning research. So 
this is the setting, and to give you a little bit of a better idea, this is what students got after the experiments, and we asked them, tell me what you're doing uh, here, explain um, what you're doing. So this is the, the cute recall uh, condition that we actually added to the experiment. And in order, and, and what we aimed here was to, to look for, can we use these new measures uh, to say something about concepts that we had been using uh, for a long time in other contexts. And interesting with eye tracking is that there's a long tradition in, re in, in reading research uh, already that could give us some indication of how to make sense uh, on these measures. Uh, for instance, that when people spend more time on relevant words and facts, that this... Um, uh, uh, yeah, that, that people spend more time on relevant words and facts and that they look back more to relevant uh, words and facts. So we, we could hypothesize that in the deep processing conditions, students would, would find these uh, other things more important and look back to other things than in a surface learning condition because they would find other things uh, more important. So what we did is we created so-called areas of interest which means that you actually label the different text, the different sentences in the text. You label which are essential key phrases and words, and which parts in the text are facts and details. Uh, and we looked whether there was a difference. And uh, based on this first study, we were actually quite enthusiastic, because indeed we could see that students in the deprocessing condition looked longer and more at essences when they looked back. Uh, to them uh, for the first time and over the whole trial, although a small effect, the effect was bigger in the surface processing condition where students looked longer and more at details and definitions when they looked back. So we felt that yeah, maybe we can use this technology uh, when we want to do, to, uh, as an additional measure to look at how uh, students process their learning. Uh, so, the next question we asked ourselves then, because we, still, uh, we wanted to know also more about all the self-report instruments and feedback instruments we, we are still uh, using, is that how these processing strategies as measured by these general self-report instruments are linked to uh, the task-specific eye-tracking uh, data. So how do they match when we give you a questionnaire? How does it match with your actual learning behavior as we measure it with, with, an, with an eye tracker? Are we talking about similar things or not? And that's what we did in the second study, where we actually used the learning, a uh, short version of the learning pattern uh, questionnaire and, and invited people then uh, to come and, and study text. So, Based on the data of the questionnaire, uh, we uh, created four profiles, students scoring high on deep learning strategies but low on surface uh, learning strategies, which would be the typical deep approaches to learners, so the deep learner. Students scoring high on surface approach to learning but low on deep approaches to learning would be the typical surface approaches to learning, but they're also where a bunch of students scoring high on both, and students scoring high on um, uh, low on both. So what we did is from each, we did a cluster analysis, and from each cluster we invited students to come to our lab, and we asked them to uh, study text. We used the handbook, the World Handbook of Happiness uh, text from. The, we also used similar text in our previous. Uh, experiment because they are kind of scientific text. It's part of not, not any uh, curriculum. Um, um, and um, yeah, we could not use the original text from the Göteborg group because our students' Swedish is very bad. So we had to look uh, for new text anyway. Uh, we added another category in the areas of interest, which is the other information. So we did not, not only look at uh, key sentences to link them to deep approaches and factual sentences to link them at surface approaches, but we also looked at other uh, information. And there were several results, but I think this is, an, this is the most interesting uh, to me. What, what these colors are, uh, 
the different colors are uh, how long students uh, looked at facts, keys, and other information. And here you see the different profiles based on the self-report questionnaires. And what we see that in, within each group, actually, there's no difference between these sentences. So students in the deep condition look as long to uh, facts uh, uh, as they did to key sentences as they did to other sentences. And this is true for every condition. But there were some significant differences between uh, the groups. This is one. The all high profile differs significantly from the all low profile. So no surprise, they just uh, watch uh, uh, or they just spend more time to facts, keys, and others than the all low condition uh, does. And this is the other one, the surface condition differs significantly from the all low. So students in the surface condition also use more uh, or spend more time in processing these type of sentences. Yeah, that's what I just said, but we didn't find any difference, for instance, between the deep learning, between the deep learners and the surface learners, which are the two main categories that we use in, in self-report uh, questionnaire. So the question is why? Uh, one part of the story is that eye tracking tells us something about the quantity of what we are doing, how much are we looking at something, but doesn't necessarily tell us about how deeply we are processing it, and time is, does not equal necessarily uh, quality. So, the story isn't finished yet. We need, we need some other measures to, <laughs> to, to help us here further, and we have done some studies, and Link Catrice presented a study on that uh, this morning, so I will not repeat uh, our work, but you can contact us if you're interested in that. So, Data triangulation is important, but different types of measurement tell us only part of the story. And tracking looks, or, or online measures look, look a promising way to tell us something, but there are definitely some drawbacks and shortcomings also there. So I want to end now because Anali showed me that I need to. Um, and I read something about what keynotes should do, and this is how you should end the keynote. So you should leave. Uh, the audience with a message, so take care. Here comes my message. You should all come to Jure <laughs> in Antwerp uh, next year, especially the junior uh, researcher. So this is one important take-home message. If you are a junior, come yourself. If you are a senior, you're still welcome, but especially stimulate your uh, juniors to come to Jure in Antwerp. And what do I think uh, we should go. Uh, I have three uh, take-home messages uh, there. This is a general one, I think, and uh, this is an introspective reflection that I want to share with you and I hope you will join me in. I think we should stop repeating the same points and limitations uh, in the discussion of our paper. We, probably, we, we should allow each, each other probably to write the same limitation three times or so. We can have a discussion on that. But then if you wrote, wrote, write it a fourth time, we should, you should get a penalty or I, I don't know what. Or you should, you should be obliged to add something else. So we should deal with these data triangulation uh, challenges in order. This is the story of the blind man and the elephant. Uh, we look at diff from different uh, perspectives to the same thing and we should combine uh, different things. So how can we do that? I think we should explore new measures uh, that will allow us for real data triangulation. We need these new measures if we want to triangulate and we need to explore them. I was very happy to see, for instance, at the SIG-14 uh, invited symposium, but it, and actually in many others, that uh, that this is really happening, and that eye tracking, electrodermal activity, fMRI, EEG, social meters, face recognitions are new technologies that are being used increasingly and that might help us. Um, and at least they, are, they help us to triangulate. But I don't want to focus on the technology aspect. I think there's also other uh, ways to triangulate. And for instance, the work by Dorothy Duchatelet, 
uh, illustrates that. We can also combine questionnaires, observations, interview, log files, but at least I think that we really should try to, to um, combine different kind, types of measures, which means that we need to collaborate also. In order to make sense, we need to collaborate with other fields. I'm myself involved in several interdisciplinary research projects. It's very interesting, also very time-consuming, uh, but you learn a lot from it. Um, and what I learned, for instance, from a, um, a uh, project that I have been working on together with Piet van den Bosse and Eva, for which I noticed that I received an email <laughs> half an hour before this conference where the, that gives us a little tip, uh, a little uh, indication of whether we will have the grant or not. So I didn't read it, so I'm still positive. Uh, uh, but, but we worked with the engineer uh, there from bioengineering, and they have lots of data because they measure, for instance, blood, and they can then they have a thousand of variables uh, uh, with, from different machines that s some are competing information, uh, some are not. And what they do is they use data visualization uh, and in order to present different models. Look, this is what the data is telling us. And then they ask you, do you have a theory that can explain uh, this or which part uh, do we need to zoom in? So it's actually data-driven, but also theory-driven. And I, I think... Um, I was skeptic, very skeptical, actually, uh, to the data-driven part, but uh, having collaborated with these engineers for one year now, I think there is a value in combining data-driven and theory-driven uh, research approaches, although it might, uh, it might not really fit with who, who, how we are raised and how uh, we sometimes think or how we think about what research or good research should be. And finally, uh, in order to make sense, uh, I, I think it's a valuable approach to do more replica studies, to start from solid studies that we have in our field with, with solid methods that have, that have been used for years, and then add a new method in order to make, to make more, to, to, to have some uh, more pillars to stand up to make sense of the data uh, that we have. For instance, the research we do ourselves um, that I have been talking about, uh, I think this has really helped us to make sense. But uh, also, for instance, in the field of expertise, I can recommend a session uh, tomorrow where, for instance, Marcus Nivela, Helen Josberger, Dagmar Festner, our past president, and Christian Hartais present research on which they kind of replicate the classical uh, expertise chess experiments, and Hans Gruber talked about this in his presidential address also, and add new measures to see how we can make sense of this. So I think this is one thing uh, that could help us in make sense. So, once more, uh, this message, and I realized that I had given my take-home message actually already in July, because early asked me to participate in a Q&A, a Q, yeah, Q and, yeah, Q and Q and yeah, question and answer session uh, uh, on Twitter. So, someone behind the Jure 2018 Twitter account, I don't know who it is, asked me what can your research mean for young researchers, especially being newcomers in this kind of workplace. Uh, and I answered that um, from my perspective, I think we should read, we should replicate, we should triangulate, and we should collaborate. And we should also enjoy life as a researcher. And that last thing is something important that I learned from my grandfather. So, Thank you, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. So thank you so much, David, for this very inspiring and illustrative lecture, which surely has raised many ideas, uh, comments, Questions, further thoughts, and you can get the microphone from here and up. There's already questions there. The ladies are bringing you the microphones here. On the back, there are several hands on, please. And you can also send uh, tweets on, on the screen at the same time <laughs> for your comments, etc. You're welcome. So 
Um, thank you, David, for the interesting talk. Um, it is, I think, interesting to see and to um, um, observe as um, higher education researchers are coming to grips with uh, knowledge work and how to prepare people for knowledge work. Our society and in our discourse is uh, moving into artificial intelligence, automation, and how to uh, uh, function in this kind of new um, emergent settings. In, indeed, many knowledge work occupations are either disappearing altogether or are changing dramatically in this context. I study um, crowd workers' workplace learning practices, so I study implications of um, digital platforms for how we understand and conceptualize workplace learning. And in many of these kinds of uh, emergent um, work practices, um, uh, you know, the, um, your manager is an algorithm. It is a machine that decides whether you did your job well or you didn't do your job well, how to compensate you or if to compensate you at all. So how do your, if you go to um, factory floors in Germany or in China, you will see that your collaborators are not humans, they are robots. So we work in this cobotic arrangements between machines and people. What is your take on these uh, kind of unfolding reality that is that we find ourselves in, are higher education researchers thinking at all about these um, new um, uh, ways in which uh, work and workplaces um, are configured and um, help to prepare? Uh, students to function effectively and productively in these kind of settings? Thank you, Anush, for this difficult question. Uh, um, first of all, let me say that I'm, that I'm uh, actually quite optimistic about these developments, and I, I think that they, they sound very scary, uh, but I think that they open new perspectives uh, also, uh, new ways of in, uh, in, in interaction. Um, um, so I'm, 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 I think this is an interesting uh, development and a, a development that, that will happen. Uh, are we preparing uh, our students for a life in, in, in this society? Um, I'm not sure whether we do already, but I think that... that, that, that um, that, 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 that probably doesn't differ that much uh, uh, from uh, how we are preparing students for a, uh, for a, for a life in, 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 uh, in, in the workplace as the workplace looks now. And, and for instance, uh, looking critically at what you see, um, uh, think, think for yourself. Um, are, are things that are uh, make sure that you know what you're talking about. Are things that are still important in any kind of, of environment. Uh, I realize that a computer might not listen uh, <laughs> to your to your critiques, but um, I would hope that organizations uh, uh, are open to comments of smart smart people in order uh, when when the machine does stupid uh, things and for instance in the in the data visualization what i is it, what is interesting is the interaction between the machine and and the human because um, the the data visualization generates uh, by lots of uh, pictures but it's still a human based on different theoretical perspective that needs to interpret it so i um not sure whether this is an answer. I'm also not sure whether I'm able to, <laughs> to clearly answer that. But let me say that I've, I'm, I'm quite positive about this develop. I'm not negative about these developments, and I think that we can indeed prepare uh, students. Please, to uh, start thinking about these things as um, higher education researchers. So it was kind of an implicit <laughs> call. Play call to, okay. to start yeah. thinking about it. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I, I was very happy with the, your conclusions and the, 
the direction you took from the assumptions you started with, but I was really looking for maybe you to disturb some of the research that's, that you're reporting on rather than accepting it from a particular angle. So what I'm, what I'm getting at here is there's a whole um, tradition in this approaches to learning research which says that we're not talking about invariant characteristics of students, that what we're looking at in approaches to learning is very contingent. It's contingent upon the incentives and the circumstances and a given person might approach things in one way in one situation, but in a quite a different way in another situation. In which case we need to focus a lot more, not on the individual, the highly individualised approach that, that you seem to be suggesting, and rather more on what are these contingencies, mm -hmm. what are the circumstances, what are the environments in which they operate, because it seems that, that a lot of that research you're reporting on could be used to argue the fact that it isn't something that students get better and they should get deeper and deeper. That's not a trajectory, that's a choice. Yeah, well, a contingent choice. Yeah, and I, 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 uh, I agree, and I think that's exactly what was our argument in the, in the, in the review paper to say that um, this interaction with the context is, so, it's, uh, uh, is important uh, uh, from that perspective to say something useful. And what we see when you do long, the longitudinal research, that you do research across uh, context and then that, that, that just doesn't fit uh, with, uh, or, or that was our, our reflection, uh, so to speak, so that doesn't fit with, with the idea that the, the, the interesting thing in that concept is the interaction between the learning environment and the learner. So if you, if you, if you skip that in order to do longitudinal research, then probably that is not the best concept to look at longitudinal research. So that was the point that I wanted to make. I didn't want to say that it's not useful at all. I want to say that it's useful for a certain purpose and not useful for other purposes. So. Thank you. Um, this is possibly quite provocative, but some people talk about linguistic imperialism in relation to the dominance of the English language, particularly in academic discourse and dis uh, academic co contexts. So my question relates to that. You're interested in how students read. Do you think that's influenced by whether they are reading, how much and to what extent do you think that is influenced by the extent to which they're reading in their first language or in English perhaps as a second language? Uh, well, I, I, definitely there's a lot of research uh, and I was in a very interesting symposium this morning and Patricia Alexander uh, made a point that prior, you're talking about prior knowledge or that links to prior knowledge and prior knowledge is extremely important, uh, uh, of course, and we didn't, we didn't do much with that. We're taking it into account in other studies. So, yeah, I, I think that's, uh, that, that, that's one aspect that influence uh, how and why uh, you read. Uh, in our studies, um, we presented st students with Dutch uh, texts, and I think that all students were also Dutch, uh, well, Flemish, Dutch uh, native speakers. Uh, so we don't have uh, something that we can take a closer look in, into that, but definitely uh, that would affect students' prior knowledge on, on, on what they're learning and how well they comprehend it. So these are very plausible explanations of, of that could make sense, or that could help us in making sense about where we look, where, what the eye tracking data, for instance, Thanks, would yeah. tell us. We'll ask that question because I work in a Dutch speaking context in Amsterdam, All right. where students are required to study, read, write, speak in English. They are not, they are not, in, they, are, they're not they don't use their own language in academic contexts, yeah. only in All social right. contexts. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, here, here, here. All right. <laughs> uh, thank you for your very interesting keynote. And 
I uh, agree totally with you that we need to have more measures when we try to uh, uh, get more knowledge about how students learn and how that develops, which, open up, which opens up, of course, a new area of new questions, which is very good. And one of those questions has to do with the nature of eye tracking uh, and uh, combining what you said and what Lane said this morning with what Tamara van Gogh said yesterday. Uh, I wonder uh, the fundamental question, what is the correspondence between what people look at and what they think? You know, I don't consider myself an expert in eye tracking yet. <laughs> um, but yeah, these are important questions uh, to tackle. Uh, I think and that we can, uh, well, they are important questions and we need to dig in uh, into that. And I, I, I would say that well, there's a lot of questions with new uh, measures uh, and you can use these questions to say, well, we not need to do that yet. But I think it's uh, interesting to explore, to, to explore it and to be humble about the kind of conclusions uh, we can, uh, we can uh, make. But I do think that they can tell us, uh, or they might tell us uh, interesting things and uh, some things uh, we don't know or I don't know, maybe other people in the room uh, do know, but that should not prevent us from uh, trying uh, to look from different angles at, at, at this phenomenon. But it's a very fundamental uh, question, uh, of course. Yeah, I was when you, were, when you were telling, for example, that deep learners uh, do not process key sentences longer, hmm? I would say, well, why would they? They are bad readers, if they would. They read as fast as, as everybody, but probably after they read, they start thinking and you don't see that on the eye tracker. So what, what is the... Yeah, you would expect the, uh, for, for our, our hypothesis, so that's another hypothesis that you could test, of course, but our hypothesis here was that they would look back more uh, to, this, to these aspects, but um, uh, one in, uh, it's, it's also an experimental setting here. We only presented the text once. When students are studying, they, they read the text uh, once and they make some notes and maybe a day later or two days later they take the text back again and, and maybe that's the interesting point in time uh, to investigate how students are, are learning. I don't know. So I, um, There's a lot of questions we can still raise, a lot of hypotheses uh, that, that are relevant, uh, uh, I think, or that, that could make sense in order, in order to get a better understanding of, of what's happening. Mike, I also had a question, and Luke, yeah. Uh, thank you, David, for your interesting keynote. Uh, it was really nice to listen to. Um, I just had a thought in relation to uh, Jan Vermunt's uh, question, because I was thinking uh, we are talking about measurements, we are about talking about uh, cognitive processing, but I think often the task uh, has been a little bit forgotten. So the focus on what actually do we ask of our students, of our participants in our experiments, and why are we asking to do them those tasks, and maybe better to analyze those tasks, and then I think that would also uh, help to, to uh, strengthen our hypothesis. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> that would be the short answer, I think. It's not a question. No, yeah, it's, it's a good comment. Yeah. So, thank you very much for your keynote. Um, your topic is preparing lifelong learners, but you presented mainly research on, on reading. So, is lifelong learning um, just reading, or is it also like uh, communicating, presenting, um, producing, um, sharing, whatever? Yeah, of course, it's it's uh, broader. The, the the reason why I why I uh, why I in the end went to the, the eye-tracking studies for which uh, we started from reading is that uh, 
the, the lifelong learning uh, in higher education, and or when we're talking about, we need to prepare lifelong learners. Often, that is, uh, in, in, there's a shortcut made that said that it means that we need to prepare students for being deep learners, and in, in so that that was the the, the step I uh, I took there. Deep learners, the different theoretical frameworks. Uh, there, where do they come from? The, uh, I agree that these questionnaires. The, 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 they, they, tap into, they take into account a wide uh, variety uh, uh, of concepts, uh, but I wanted to go back to the origins, uh, as I called it, in order to, uh, to, to have some, um, uh, something uh, to, do, uh, to, to investigate at a task level, uh, because that's what we need to do in, in the art, uh, with, when we combine it with process measures, um, I think, and then you have a, a specific task, and, uh, because the tradition uh, started uh, with reading, we also went back uh, uh, to reading, and that's also a clear task that you can ask, so that links to, to Micah's task. Uh, so, yeah, you, you lose a lot of information if you, if you, uh, or you lose a lot of context uh, if you investigate it there, but I think that's something, yeah, I think we need, we, that we need, uh, that we need this kind of research also in order uh, or we need, I think we need, I needed it in order to look critically at the own, the own uh, self-report instruments and that's why I started with the Learning Above the Ruler project and indicated the other project. We are providing knowledge workers, uh, students in vocational education, students in higher education with self-assessment instruments that are widely used and that measure at the general uh, level and the question is uh, as to what do we actually, uh, what can we say about this because then these knowledge workers come to the company and say, okay, what can I, what can I do uh, in this specific situation or students say, okay, what can I do in a specific situation? And then I think that there are lots of differences between tasks. So there is a kind of tension, uh, I, thi uh, I think, there. And yeah, that, that, that's something that we wanted to tackle. So I don't want to say that lifelong learning is only about reading. I, I, I narrowed it to that in order to be able uh, to talk about that research and, and to be able to do that research because the task, as Micah said, is important uh, there. And I agree that reading a text, um, uh, there's, it's still, I think it's still an important task, also in lifelong learning, because reading from text, both in higher education, but also as professionals, we still learn a lot in social context, but also by, ch by looking, checking for things, consulting books, maybe not so more, but quickly, uh, looking at uh, reading is still an important skill also in terms of lifelong learning. But there's more, I agree. First of all, thank you very much, David. It was excellent. <laughs> um, I, I just want to provide a, 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 a small, small encouragement, both for you and for the people watching. Um, reflecting on Patricia's comments this morning, that uh, processing is not, uh, not necessarily deep nor surface for an individual, but is obviously context development. Context specific and, and people use surface and deep interchangeably and neither is good or bad. I think you're well situated to expand on that, um, but to do it you need collaboration. You need, you need a wider variety of people to join you in doing this kind of work uh, with a range of, range, of, uh, range of students, secondary, higher ed, uh, middle school even, uh, to talk about how and how and where surface and deep processing is applied uh, depending on prior knowledge and the context and the age of the individual. This is the kind of work I would love to see you do. Uh, it's a, throwing the gall on out to you, of course, but All right. there you go. <laughs> Thank you for the suggestion. <laughs> or do you want me to elaborate on that, Luke? <laughs> <Ooh. laughs> yeah, well, I, 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 yeah, of course, these are all interesting uh, suggestions, and some of, the, some of these suggestions we are uh, um, tackling. Um, uh, and some of them we're not yet, so <laughs> we'll, it's also a funding, a funding issue and a, and a, and a time issue, but I, I, uh, I'm open to collaborations to get the full picture uh, from student learning in, in vocational education, higher education, and the first steps in, 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 in the workplace and look at how students and, and, and workers uh, learn in this kind of context. And, Okay, any other comments, 
questions, additions, etc. Still, yes, there were taking place some very uh, active deep learning. First, they were presented some questions, and then they were answered in, in concerning how, how do you get more evidence and, and what do you mean by this getting more evidence with these new facilities. And then the answer was about increasing the validity of the, of the research. And okay. But maybe there was already very, uh, very independent and public <laughs> deep learning taking place there. Okay, but do you still have, we have still time for a couple of comments there. Can you give the microphone? Well, thank you, uh, David, uh, for a very, very uh, interesting, and especially, uh, I think uh, you really uh, also brought up some stuff for discussion. And uh, also your conclusion on triangulation, I would say also conceptual triangulation. Mm -hmm. uh, in Norway, we have a saying that goes like this, uh, trolls go into birds, trolls, you know, monsters, and that means also that uh, uh, words get real. And I'm, I'm wondering whether you have a discussion or could bring in a discussion about what are this kind of dichotomy between deep and surface? Uh, uh, how, because there are all these dichotomies in, in, uh, in learning research and very often uh, the, the deep is associated with something good uh, and also then what is surface is something bad. And you talked about your grandfather and another working life, which maybe then might uh, require more rapid learning and <laughs> less slower learning. <laughs> and how does that relate then to the goodness of the deep and the badness of the surface? And, yeah. and also the question about contingencies here. Yeah. Uh, and also your, your advocation for, for uh, interdisciplinary uh, uh, kind of learning. Because interdisciplinary learning is also a kind of a surface learning. You have to rapidly understand what the others mean by this and that. You're not an expert, you're not deep in that knowledge area. So again, pro I, I wonder, that kind of uh, conceptual triangulation should be very helpful, I think. Yeah, well, uh, I agree um, that uh, what you call conceptual triangulation is needed. I don't agree with the, the deep being good and the surface being bad. I think that these are different kind of strategies uh, or, well, depending on the theoretical model. Uh, so there you have the, the conceptual triangulation. Uh, but if you look at, for instance, uh, uh, how in the learning pattern model uh, also the, the, the surface learning strategies uh, are described or even also within the students' approach to learning, they, they are memorizing is a strategy that we need and it's very smart. Uh, uh, so you, I think we need both uh, of these strategies. I did not talk much about the research about our surface processing strategies uh, evolved in my talk because I had to stay within a certain time frame. And, uh, but, but there's also re, uh, research on that, obviously. So um, I agree with uh, the conceptual uh, clarity and I think Sometimes conceptual frameworks are mixed up and we talk about deep and surface without clearly defining what we mean. And what's deep in one theoretical framework might even be surface uh, in another. And I think the important thing is that, that there are different kind of strategies that are important for students. And some of, in some contexts, some strategies are more inter relevant in terms of outcomes uh, than a, in other um, uh, contexts. Um, I don't know, if that, well, that's, that's part of, the answer, of an answer uh, to your question, but I deeply agree with the uh, conceptual uh, um, triangulation. Oh, 
if we don't find any more comments, uh, then before I thank you, I, I would like to add about these advertisements where we can continue the discussion what we have been have here, and I, I wish to thank you all the active participation. Uh, David already mentioned the SIG 14 next conference. Oh, was it? Yeah, Learning and Professional Development. It's next year in Geneva, yeah, in September. But before that, there is also Higher Education SIG conference in uh, Germany, Kassel. And even before that, there is the SIG 27, which is online measures of learning processes. Uh, the SIG conference is in Poland, Warsaw, uh, in June 2018. So this work continues, continues there. And, but at the moment, I wish to thank David so much for, for your very inspiring uh, lecture and also the discussion for the whole audience and as a small memorial, I present for this keynote. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Anneli. Thank you. Thanks a lot.